Okay, ah, it's on. Uh, so welcome to tonight's installment of the, I guess not quite new, SciArc Cinema Series. Uh, this is the third year uh, that we've been doing a series of films that may or may not be related to architecture, um, certainly relating to technology, to visual culture. Uh, these are always free, these are open to the public. Um, it's the first Tuesday of every month during the school year. Um, in November, I will tell you, we're showing Coherence, uh, which was a film from 2013, um, crazy multi-universe science fiction film that one of my students tipped me to last year, and I loved it so much, I cleared room on two syllabi to throw it on, and, uh, and I'm really excited that we're gonna screen it in November and have the director here. Um, it's one of these puzzle films where there's no answer, so I imagine many people will have many questions. Um, and then in December, we're showing Donnie Darko, which is another favorite relating to time travel, and I suspect also connects with your work. I wanted to ask you about it. And James Duvall, who plays the creepy bunny rabbit, will be uh, our guest here. So, um, so my name is Michael Stock. I'm the host and, and, and put the series together. Um, this is my fifth year as a professor here of film studies, um, teaching, uh, I guess the first course I taught here was a history of comic books. Um, and then we moved into histories of punk. And since then there's been several science fiction film classes, an anime class, uh, a class on time travel, um, which was, kind of conspicuously a flop, weirdly, um, but the course that I did on the end of the world was a big success, and um, I sent uh, Tim the syllabus, actually, and uh, yeah, so we can, we can talk about that as well. Uh, so tonight's film, critically acclaimed documentary, Living in the Future's Past, uh, released in 2018, directed by Susan Cassera, and featuring our special guest here tonight, uh, Timothy Morton. Hello. So please welcome our guest. Thank you for having me. Uh, so Tim is here all week at SciArc teaching a master class, and um, this is actually kind of, this is your welcome. We just, put, we just get you in here, we put a light on you, and, and we're going to talk, and then, and then the master class will start, you know, My, the, later. The, 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 thing about, the thing about Björk, it's like, she, said, she tells me she's an introvert, yeah? And it's like, but you wore a swan dress to Hollywood, what the hell's that all about? And, and, and I, I, I don't believe in this category of introvert anymore. I think basically it's like normal, socially acceptable outgoingness, right? Plus exhibitionism, and then probably some kind of phobia of exhibitionism, right? And, and, and that kind of translates to this idea that you're an introvert, but actually what you really want to do is jump up on a table and start singing, you know? And so, um, thank, thank you for pleasuring my inner introvert, or something <laughs> like that. Very cool. Um, so, before we talk, I want to give, I want to read your, your bio, so people, so those of you who don't know uh, who Tim is, know. Uh, Timothy is a professor of literature and the environment, uh, also the Rita Shea Guffey Chair in English at Rice University. He has collaborated with Bjork, and we're going to talk about her tonight, uh, with Jennifer Walsh, with Jeff Bridges, who is the narrator of the film tonight, uh, Sabrina Scott, uh, Olafur Eliasson, Farrell Williams. Uh, he co-wrote and, uh, and appears in the film we will be seeing tonight. Uh, he is the author of Bjork. Being Ecological, Humankind, Solidarity with Non-Human People, Dark Ecology for a Logic of the Future, Nothing, Three Inquiries in Buddhism, uh, Hyperobjects, Philosophy and Ecology After the End of the World, uh, and one of, a chapter from that book was assigned to my students in the End of the World class, by the way, and, uh, and Realist Magic, uh, Objects, Ontology, uh, Causality, which I think was Bjork's favorite? Yeah. Is that what she said? That's yeah. the one that she read. Um, yeah. So, and, and over 200 essays on philosophy, ecology, literature, music, art, architecture, design, and food. Uh, so, but I thought since my background is predominantly music and then film, that's how we'll kind of start the talk tonight. Music and then film, and then we'll watch the film. Oh, it's perfect for me. Okay. Uh, so, uh, let's see here. So, one of your most influential ideas is the concept of the hyperobject, mm -hmm. uh, something that exceeds scale or temporality. And so I thought, actually, before we jump into music, I was wondering if you could probably introduce this audience 
including a bunch of my first year students, um, to this concept of for the hyper object thank you so and, much. and how it relates very, to ecology. Very, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And um, so a few years ago, I came up with this word, you know, because I was writing this book called, called The Ecological Thought. And in the last chapter, I was thinking about what is that? You know, like, like imagine all the styrofoam ever, right? Like all the, all the styrofoam cups and all the other styrofoam stuff. And at some moment, it's basically, you know, a human being thing that we use. But for most of its life, it's sitting somewhere else, like in a landfill or somewhere like that. And what, what is that? What's the word for that? Well, it's a thing, I guess. So I guess I should say object. And it's beyond my normal way of understanding it. So it's a hyper object, like the word television, it's like a sort of mixture of Greek and Latin, you know, and um, I guess the thing about them is that they're, they're, they're things that are so massively distributed in space and time that you, um, you can't see them all at once. You can think them, but you can't see them. It's actually quite important to say that because some people get the wrong idea, like you can't comprehend them at all. That's not true. You can totally understand what they are. You can understand what global warming is. You can understand what the biosphere is. You can understand what the solar system is. But it's very hard to visualize it, even using very powerful computational devices. It's, it's hard to see it, right? Like, and so they have this kind of weird, mysterious quality. One of the worst ones um, Like global warming is really bad, but, but mass extinction is the, what's really happening right now. And um, scientists can't even see it, because it's so huge, isn't that funny? It's, such, it's, it's the hugest thing ever, but it can't be seen. And I, I, I read this article in Nature Biology, and they basically said, we're looking for specters of mass extinction, because we can't see it properly, and you, you, you'll never guess what they used as a kind of signal um, unusual species rarity, right? So just slightly too few of this fish, right? Just slightly too few of this coral, and that's the mass extinction signal. It's not this huge big thing, because it's everywhere, because it's exactly ev in your face. You can't actually see it, right? And the thing about these hyperobjects is, of course, you, you're, you're part of them. You're part of a whole bunch of, like, overlapping ones, you know? So they're sort of inside of you, right? Like you've got all these substances and things inside of you that are sort of part of some hyperobject or other. You're sort of in, 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 interpenetrated by them. Um, so I guess that's I guess that's what they are. So the the term hyperobject was inspired by Bjork by 1996 single Hyper Ballad. Yeah. Um, so I guess. How did, you, how did you discover Bjork, first of all, which is just a fan of you, as, okay. or a question of you as a music fan. Right like, on. How does one fall right in on. love with that music? Um, I'm from 1988. Um, not, not, I wasn't born then, can you tell? Um, I was born, oh, thank you for laughing. I was born in, I think, I was born in 1968, um, but sort of culturally, emotionally, I'm from 1988, which is the whole kind of house music, ravey. Thing. I was part of that very strongly for many years. And then I went to America, and I, 1988 sort of followed me all the way to 1998, so that was quite good. Um, and somewhere in the middle, um, Björk re uh, released Hyper Ballad, but um, I guess, um, you know, being a bit of a fan of the Sugar Cubes, which is the band that she was in, and then spending the, the summer when she released the first album debut, um, solo album, just listening to it every day with my friends, going, what on earth is this? What is this? You know? Um, still don't quite know what it is, actually. Um, and so by the time Hyper Ballad came out, I was really committed to listening to, to Bjerg. So, so is it that, that abstraction, that, that weird, not quite, that feeling you can't quite grasp of why you love Bjork that mm -hmm. then you channeled into this idea of the hyper object, which is also mm. something you can't quite. Mm. For me, what she does, she's kind of in the female surrealist artist tradition, right? And she's showing you, in a way, the wiring under the board 
of the emotion or the idea that you're having, right? Instead of writing a song that says, you know, I love you, but it's a bit complicated, she writes a song that says, I'm sitting on the edge of this cliff, and I'm imagining throwing objects off of the cliff, and I'm imagining that I myself am one of those objects that I throw off the cliff, and when I throw myself off and I hit the ground there, will my eyes be closed or open when I, when I look at them? And um, I think what fully, fully switched me on to this tune was a certain remix of it by a, a guy called Beaumont Hammond, who's like a sort of John and Basie kind of a remix person. And um, he, he, he took that phrase, closed or open, and just repeated it over and over and over and over again sort of quite in, intensely and hypnotically. I'm a huge repetition fan. Yeah. I'm a huge repetition fan. You know? um, so I think that's what really compelled me about it. You know? So before we were sitting and, and wired for sound here, uh, you told me that your uh, dwelling in rave culture actually taught you more about environmental concerns yeah. than, than spending time in sort of nature. Yeah. How, uh, can you tell um, us how that works? Well, I guess just the, just the feeling of being with other, be with, with other people, many, many other people, you know, 20,000 other people. Wordsworth wrote this poem called um, Lines Written a Few Miles Above Tintern Abbey. It's often, it's often called Tintern Abbey for short, but actually it's not about this abbey, it's about like, him a few miles above it. And um, the last year that I was in England, I accidentally moved to America in 1992. The fact that I, I'm here right now is a total accident. You know, I, I didn't mean to move, you know. Um, but for some reason, I guess I like it because I'm, I'm still here. Um, and um, but me and my best friends went to this thing. I guess it was called Perception. And it, it, it was right near where Wordsworth wrote this poem. You know, so I thought I would cutely call the introduction of my first explicitly ecological book "Lines Written a Few Miles Above, a Few Miles Above Tintern Abbey." You know, um, thanks for not laughing at all about that. Um, just the notion of being part of something really big. Um, that, 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 that you're not actually like dissolved into it, but you're part of it, I guess, is the, the, basic, the basic thing. Mm -hmm. Plus, I love music, and I'm a repetition freak, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know? uh, so you collaborated with Bjork. Yeah. Can you talk about, first of all, tell people what yeah. it is, what, and, well, and how you came together. I mean, how right you on. went from sort of being mutual fans to, right to collaborating. Well, I have to thank Daniel and Martin from Matt Moss. Um, Björk was um, separating from her ex-person, Matthew, and I, I don't know with, whether she was upset or whatever, but she probably was, because it's a, an upsetting thing, right? And um, Matt Moss, like, like this sort of sound art pop band, right? Um, I'm working with, with, with uh, Martin right now. We're doing this opera together. Um, and, and their, their pals, Matt, uh, Matt Moss and Björk, and Björk was like, what, what can I read? So they gave us something to read, and it was this book that I'd written about causality called Realist Magic. So she fell in love with the object-oriented ontology stuff, and she decided she wanted to do a thing with me for, the, for her 50th birthday, which was this big retrospective that was gonna happen at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City a few, a few years ago. And so, you know, I, I don't know about you, but when you get emails that are really important, do you ever, like, not even see them? They look, like, invisible? Like, all the advert ones look really compelling, you know? And I get all these funny emails from all these funny people nowadays, and some of them are like, you wouldn't believe that the thoughts in my head are exactly the same as the thoughts in your head. And I'm like, oh, okay. But I, so I have a big folder called Query, so I file them away, you know? And then, the, and then someone else writes an email like, I'm an artist, you're somebody who works with artists, work with me. And then two weeks later, like, why haven't you replied? You know, because <laughs> I filed your email away. Um, and um, so the first email I got from, from, from Björk Space was like almost illegible. It was like, blah, 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 Björk, blah, 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 I'm the manager, blah, 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 is this your right email address, blah, blah, blah. I didn't even notice 
You know, like, 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 like three weeks ago, I got this email from the Pope's representative in Norway, and it was like, blah, 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 Pope, something, 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 would you like to do a thing with the Pope, something, 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 blah, blah, blah. I ignored it for like two weeks, didn't even read it. You know, those emails look so bland. And um, then about seven months later, I just totally let go of, I was like, yeah, this is my email address, you got it right, to Derek, who's the manager of Björk, right? And then a few months later, she wrote me, I was watching the telly, and there was this message, that it, it said words was the title, you know. It said, hello, my name is Björk, and I was like, oh, awesome, it's you, you know. And I, I don't know why, but from the first moment, I decided, although, you know, I'm a huge big fan, I was like weeping with happiness, that we would just talk like equal people, because she's also a person, and that's probably how it worked. And her idea was like, I want to know what my ism is. What, who am I? Like, what am I up to? Because I'm doing this thing for MoMA. And so we talked about it. And then we realized that talking about it was the thing that we were doing. Like, the email exchange about it was exactly what it was. And what she wanted to do was put this email exchange on a flag. She was in London. She was like, Tim, I've just been to this shop. I've seen all these flags. I want to put a thing on a flag. Like, Gmail, like, perfectly done, like, accurate, but, like, sewn with like stitching and all that stuff, like the sort of ancient and modern art, craft, right? Um, I said, no, mate, what, you, what we've got to do is make a blanket, you know? We've got to have a blanket so you can sort of wrap yourself in it, but you can't see all of it all at once because this is object-oriented ontology stuff. And um, she loved that idea, but it was too close to the deadline to do that. So somewhere in our heads, we've got this fantasy thing of this little blanket that you can buy that's got this kind of correspondence on it, and you can wrap yourself in it. It sounds so nice, doesn't it? I'd really like it if it actually got made. And, and, and somebody started to make it, but it was just too much work to, to do it, basically. So the final, the final work is? It's a little booklet. Text, yeah. It's in a, if you go on Amazon, you can probably still find it. It's called Birg. There's like five or six booklets in there, and one of them is R1. And I think the title is based on my description of um, looking at my first child being born, you know, which it's, it's, it's something like a huge ab sunlit abyss from the future staring back at you or something like that. And the, what, what was awesome about working with her was that we let ourselves go crazy in, without any limits, you know. We just sort of wrote crazy stuff to each other for two or three months. Yeah, best thing ever. Yeah, the, uh, the emails, or a bunch of them, are up on the Dazed uh, website. I don't know if it's the complete, complete exchange, but um, I, I had started reading them Sunday evening before I went to host a show of goth bands. And then I got home after amazing performance, but kind of a disappointing turnout which as a concert promoter is a, something you have to look for. Uh, anyway, so, so I started reading, I read the rest of these emails. I think I emailed Tom at like 2 a.m. I'm like, you have to read these emails because they're, they're really, they're amazing. Yeah. I mean, and uh, they're moving and, and thoughtful. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and I thought this connects with one of the things that, that's, that you bring up in, in a couple of your books, this idea of your job as philosopher being an amplifier of an artist. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to yeah. ask you about, of course. about that, because that's, okay, that's so a really interesting relationship, I think. Like, personally, I don't know about anyone else, but like, I think of myself as a clown. You know, like, when, when Socrates describes himself as a clown, you know, there's this poem by Stevie Smith called Not Waving But Drowning. And he's like, hello, I'm drowning. Can anybody hear me? And I think that's like Socrates. He's not actually taking the mic. You know, he's not messing with your head. He's actually saying, hello, I actually am a clown. Like, everyone thinks of, of him as like Columbo, the, the detective guy from the 70s, right? Like, he keeps asking irritating questions until the other person's head explodes. But what if you got to this point where ideas were like, clown shoes, in a way, right? Like, you're like, look, at, look, this is an idea. Look at this funny clown shoe. Everyone else takes it seriously. And like, but look, it's a clown shoe, you know? Um, and you can't do that job unless you're with somebody else, right? Um, and so I've, I feel like 
you know, I'm, I'm holding the door open for something different to happen, AKA the future, right? Like the future, you know, the future? Is there one? Like, like carrying on doing the same thing means that there isn't one, right? Very obviously right now, yeah? And so therefore the future is just simply the possibility that things might be different, right? And to me, Literally, art is the future. It's from, it comes from the future. It's not just a weird image, right? Because think about it this way. Um, when you look at my face, you're seeing a map of everything that happened to my face, right? Like, you're looking at the past. Like, for example, when I was 19 years old, I had this really bad acne, and you can sort of see the, tra like the scars of it and all the traces of it in my face. That's the past, right? Like, when you look at a poem, you're looking at a series of decisions that were made and, you know, like, 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 let's have rhyme here, let's have an image here, let's have a sonnet structure, right? Like, that's the past, you know, whoever made that decision or whatever made that decision. Maybe it's the author, maybe it's the society the author lived in, who cares, right? But basically, it's the past. But what is this poem? You know, what does it really mean? Who is this Tim Morton person? That's the future, right? And so from my point of view, when you see a thing, it's like you're looking at the past and the future kind of weirdly sliding over each other without touching. Do you ever get that feeling when you're walking up a stopped escalator that it's, you get this funny sort of moving feeling, even though it's not moving because you're habituated to it and moving? It's sort of like that, you know? And this idea of present, like to be real, a thing has to be present, is, is like this fake idea that's probably like causing a lot of trouble, you know? And so I, 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 I call it nowness instead of present. And it's to do with this funny relative motion feeling, right? And my job, I feel like I've got two jobs. Like, what, like one job is changing the past so the future can be different. And that's to do with like interpreting things differently, right? Like you can always do that. Because who knows how many readings of a text there are, right? There might be in, like, like, like infinity. It doesn't mean going on and on and on forever. It means uncountable for now, right? Like maybe there's three. But you don't know that yet. You can't know that yet. Um, when Blake says, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, he doesn't mean, like, hold this thing that goes on and on and on forever because I've taken acid and it can just keep going and going and going. Thanks for being very serious about it. And um, it, 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 it actually implies a kind of uncountability, right? So that's part of it, changing the past. But the other part of it is, like, being the doorman for the future like you're sort of holding the door open for, for future stuff to happen, for, for stuff to be different, you know? And so it's like art is in front and you're behind and your job is, you know, I, I, I think I wrote a message to Bjerke about it. I was like, you're the future, I'm the past. Tag, you're it. I basically said, I think, it was roughly it. So, so is it because we are in the middle of the end of the world, or I guess, not necessarily middle, because we're in it, does that up your responsibility for doing things I like think. this, like as a philosopher? Yeah, end, end of the world. Um, I was talking to Extinction Rebellion Youth a couple of weeks ago for this show that I'm doing for the BBC, and um, they got very upset by this phrase, end of the world. They were like, what the fuck, Tim? You know? And I suddenly realized, oh my God, I, I, I pitched that phrase for people of my age and people of their age who want to live I think that's just a horrible, horrible thing that I just said. So I actually felt really, ba really badly that I wrote this phrase. The subtitle of Hyper Objects is Philosophy and Ecology After the End of the World. Um, and so what I, I, I explained to them, it doesn't mean you're going to not exist. What it means is this idea that the world is just for human beings and is made real only by human beings and the only thing that's important about it is what human beings make of it is obviously over, right? Like, like, like this idea that, and in particular, of course, white male human beings, you know, um, the civilization people who, do, who are responsible for this shit. Um, that world is, is over, you know. It, 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 but, but, but right now, some, some, some people don't know that, right? It's like Wiley Coyote ran off the cliff and doesn't realize that he's off the cliff yet. You know, and so like my job is to convince Wiley Coyote, you, you fell off the cliff, dude. It's time to let go. You know. Uh, let's see here. 
let's see, one of the, I guess one of the mm. points where I connected with your work, and I mentioned this in the email I sent a couple days ago, is the connection you make with goth. Yeah. I mean, you sort of summon the gothness. And in yeah. my notes, I, I always had to type it in all caps here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, you connected it with, well, in a couple different places in your work, but one of the places is, is with you and with Bjork and her yeah. fictional, fictional alter ego, Isabel, mm -hmm. which you describe uh, pure fiction plus seriousness, and you can't tell where the two join or separate like Robert Smith's hairdo. <laughs> So, yeah. from the cure, yeah. in case you don't. Um, so anyway, oh. what, what is it about goth? I mean, other than, obviously, the 1988 Wait start on. point, but Wait like, on. what is it about that subculture, or that Wouldn't concept you connect with? Wouldn't it be so with? awesome to be Robert Smith, because he's always worn this wig and all that, and the makeup and all that. So when he goes down the street not wearing it, nobody realizes he's, he's Robert Smith. He can just go to the supermarket. But he's been in this band for, like, decades. You know, basically the winners if you're going to look at longevity as a winner thing, is the Pet Shop Boys and, and The Cure, don't you think? But like, um, so goth, funnily enough, the goth feeling, goth feel, is that a word? Like mouth feel, you know, like, like how potato chips advertise themselves by the mouth feel, the PR people are all about the texture. Mouth feel is a horrible mouth feel. The word is so, bleh. but, um, so, so goth feel, funnily enough, is science feel, right? Because the funny thing about goth is, so there's this biologist on the radio, and he's basically saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I was crying in the ocean because this sea lion mum was loving on me. It was so beautiful. This other species, this other entity was loving on me. But the way she was doing it was really gross. She was throwing me these dead penguins, right, to eat, right? And so it's this funny oscillation between disgust and enjoyment. Have you ever read these poems by Baudelaire called Spleen? There's like a whole bunch of them. You know, you, you, you open up Les Fleurs du Mar, somewhere in the middle there, it's called, it says Spleen, you know, and he's like, I'm covered in horrible stuff and there's this vampire and it's all wrong and, but I'm weirdly enjoying it. But that's weirdly gross that I'm enjoying it. But it's weirdly enjoyable that it's weirdly gross that I'm enjoying it. But it's weirdly gross that it's enjoyable that it's gross that it's enjoyable. And then you turn the page and it's like, spleen. And there's a whole nother one. You know, there's, it happens so many times. Yeah. And I personally feel like this funny oscillation between disgust and enjoyment is, is, is the ecological feeling. It's like the science feeling, right? Because you're sort of open to other things happening and other species and strange things happening. Like, what the hell is this strange, you know, thing that happens when, you know, the, the, the electron, you know, seems to be going a little bit faster or slower than it should be going. Oh, dear, light speed means there's this thing called space-time, you know. We're in this weird liquid. It's not this infinite empty space at all. Um, and um, so you're sort of opening, op op you're open to things being odd and strange and different and slightly gross, you know, but, and, and, and you're sort of enjoying that. Like I talked to this geologist a couple of years ago, and she was saying, when you do a PhD in geology, when you hold a rock, you suddenly realize, I'm holding in my hand a billion years in my hand, I'm holding, right? Like, like, like we all pick up rocks, but these guys have to account for it, yeah? And they get really freaked out by it. Like, they have to spend quite a long time adjusting to this time scale. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's gross, right? Like, like, like in a very big, massive, scary way. And I feel like if anything's going to project us into the future, it's this funny feeling, like being open to things being strange and different. You know, like polar bears having a nice time. Coral still existing is nice for coral. And it's also quite nice for us in a way that we didn't quite realize because we're actually symbiotically connected to these things, right, in some way. Um, and so it's sort of about expanding pleasure in an unexpected, strange way, ecological awareness and politics and art and stuff. It's not about being efficient. It's about learning how to enjoy things that might actually be weirdly gross. Like, we've all got this kind of bacterial microbiome that we're sharing right now, you know? And there's these little crustaceans running around in your eyebrows. It's all a bit funny, yeah? So I feel like this goth sensibility is actually what's going to get us through this. And, and like, we found the magic, like, solution, 
in the early 19th century, we found the right kind of chemicals, as it were, sort of emotional attitude, phenomenological chemicals to, to make this work. We, we know the exit route from this stuff. It's, it's, it, it's not through like this horrible kind of disgust of everything. And it's not through immersing ourselves in enjoyment. It's between this funny kind of oscillation between those two categories. So I feel like goth is very important here because goth is like pop romanticism. You know, it's not this kind of highfalutin one. It's still happening. We're still in the romantic period because we've still got this kind of goth culture. And um, it's this kind of product thing and it's, it's kitschy and, and good and, and enjoyable and fun and nice, but also disturbing and weird and, and unquote gross. Yeah, that's how I'm wired. So, so at what point then in, in this sort of, the relation of gothness to this, where does melancholia come in? Oh. To, come in? Because the, you've yeah. mentioned this in, in the, the, the third thread of dark ecology, right and, and it seems like such an important point in, yeah. in all of us Very. living in, you know, in this time period. I think so too. It's like, so, so you know, I don't know about you, but um, I feel like the only thing I can work on in the situation is myself, really, like if I'm going to be responsible for it, right? And since I say things in public, I'm obviously saying them wrong because not everybody's getting behind this thing about like looking after planet Earth, right? So what is it that I'm doing? And I think what I'm doing in general, like pe 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 people like me, um, they're not helping people go through the, the, over the speed bump you know, of sort of realizing that they are, they should care, they do care, they, they, they care already, even if they feel indifferent, to, to other life forms, right? Um, and um, melancholia is a very important part of it. I'm a depression sufferer, right? So all I've got to use in my own experience and in my insights is this feeling of, of, of depression. And what I've done, like studying it and researching it and thinking about it is, it's like you've got this, like, um, if you ever feel really, s like, grief feeling, not, 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 not just sad, but, like, depressed, you know, like, oppressed by things intensely. It's as if there's this thing inside you, and, and um, it's not exactly you, and it's kind of disturbing. You can't quite process it. You can't quite digest it. If you're just split up with somebody, you know this feeling, right? Like, goes on and on, it kind of, it's a knot in your stomach and you can't quite deal. And in a way, it's living proof that solipsism is untrue, right? Because you've got this feeling inside you that isn't you, it's something else, right? So you know that there's at least one other entity in the world apart from you, it's this feeling, right? And there's a kind of holding onto it, like you're sort of hoarding the feeling. Um, and it's a little bit like Wally, in the, in, the, in the movie, Wally, right? Like, like, he's collecting all these things, but he doesn't know why. He's got this huge collection of things. Um, and um, so, in a way, for me, melancholia is like part of how you begin to realize that you're connected to other, to other life forms. You know, like, 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 like the, the 50 DPI JPEG would be guilt. You know, like, oh my God, I, I left the gas on for 250 years, you know? Um, I'm so glad you're not laughing at any of this. And, 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 and then sort of inside the guilt is this shame, you know, but, 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 but sort of slightly higher resolution, you know? And inside the shame is the horror. You know, like the, the horror is kind of like, um, I'm, there's this horrible stuff stuck to me, I can't get rid of it, right? If you try to get rid of it, it's called National Socialism or something, you know, make America clean again. Um, and um, inside the horror is this sort of feeling of um, sort of almost laughter, like it's, it's, it's ridiculous how stuck we are in this, in this world, you know, with, there, there's sort of no way to really transcend it. And um, that's a kind of Samuel Beckett feeling. But inside that is this thing called melancholia, you know, where you're just literally like, you're just like, okay, I'm here, you're here, that's it. Yeah. Then inside the melancholia is this thing called, called sadness. I'm calling it sadness. 
Like when you, when you fall in love with somebody or when you experience something like beauty, you know, it's like you're coexisting with something for no reason. And, but you can't grasp that something. You can't like point to what's beautiful about the Mona Lisa. Like imagine if the smile was the beautiful thing, like a million photocopies of the smile would be more beautiful than the Mona Lisa, but it's not quite true, is it? Or like, imagine it was you. Like I've, I've isolated the neurotransmitter that's responsible for that, and I'm, I'm gonna make a chemical that's like that neurotransmitter. I'm, for some strange reason, I'm gonna call it MDMA, and I'm gonna take a million of these, <laughs> and yeah, then you're dead, you know, so that doesn't work either. Um, thank you. And, 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 and so it's sort of like, you're having this kind of mind meld with something that might not even be alive, let alone sentient, let alone consciousness conscious. And who started it? Was it you or the, the art thing, right? Who started that? So there's this kind of weird, uneasy coexistence. So you can't quite touch. This is kind of je ne sais quoi. So I'm call, kind of calling it sadness, yeah. And why do you feel sad? Because you're longing for some kind of connection. And, and why have that longing? Because the inside that is this kind of burning, chilly droplet of joy. You know, so you find a sort of joyfulness inside the sadness, which is what I learned from listening to way too many Cure albums. Uh, I mean, it, it's obviously, I, I think about this, I talk about this in class a lot, it's no coincidence that uh, within the music world, in, independent music world anyway, dark music is more popular now than it's been. I mean, it's, it's sort of a new golden age of yeah. dark wave, dark music. Uh, within the film world, I mean, and you mentioned this in your correspondence with Bjork, mm -hmm. like uh, a, couple year, a couple years ago, like every film was about mm -hmm. the end of the world. Yeah, every I film agree. is dystopic. Like, yeah. it no longer means, like when you say a dystopic mm -hmm. film, it's like, it's a film. Yeah, it's so, um, yeah. so... This is disturbing stuff, but I, but, yeah. it, but I read in your, in your writing, y you find hope in this. And I, yeah. I guess I yeah. wonder like how, given this normalization of dark yes. and, and the, the boring dark, as yeah. Bjork terms it, like yeah. how do you restart hope? Right well, the thing is, it's sort of like, obviously lying on the, in the fetal position going, oh my God, is, is accurate, but it's not really helping the polar bears, is it? You're just going to kind of lie there. And, and dol dolphins can't switch off the oil pipes with the flippers. They don't have the ability to hit the keyboard correctly. So it's on you, right? Like, you're not guilty because you didn't do it. Like, like, I live in Houston, and across the street from where I work is all the corporations like Chevron. They, they, they knew this was going to happen for decades, right? Like, they're guilty, but you're responsible but only because you can understand it, right? Like, like, like if you can understand that someone's gonna trip over something, you're responsible. You don't have to prove that you made them do it. In fact, if you spent that time proving that you made them do it, then probably they tripped anyway and hit themselves and got hurt. So in a funny way, like you don't even have to prove that we did global warming. Maybe jellyfish did it, who cares? But we're responsible for it because we can understand what it is, right? Um, and so, the mode in which we talk to each other about this is very, very, very important right now because like religion mode, right, like good versus evil, like um, guilt mode has probably hoovered up as many people on earth as it can possibly hoovered up. And I'm glad I'm saying this here in Los Angeles. I don't know if this is really true, but like my, my LA friends who I love so much seem to me to be more playful and silly and I like silly is a good thing for me, than the, than the San Francisco hippies. Yeah, I used to live in the Bay Area, but I'm like a traitor to that area because I like the LA bit better. And the reason why is because there's the, the, there is not this kind of extra layer of intense judgmentalness going on. There's a kind of silly playfulness going on, which is much more sort of, much more flexible and creative, yeah. Um, and um, good versus evil means there have to be some people who are evil, right, so you can feel righteous. That means that less than 7.5 billion people are involved in this, um, figuring this out, and that means that we can't do it because this is a 7.5 billion people scale problem, right? And so there has to be some other way than just collapsing, going, oh my God, I'm a bad person, right? And so hope, it doesn't necessarily mean you're just telling yourself it's okay. 
um, it could kind of mean you've got nothing to lose. You know, like in those films, like, like when I hear the phrase after the end of the world, what I like to hear is um, those kinds of movies where the lead character realizes they're already dead, right? Like there was this film in the 90s called Jacob's Ladder with Tim Robbins, and he figures out that he's already been poisoned by this drug that he's been given in Vietnam, and he's already dead. Once he figures out he's already dead, he's got this flexibility, he can do stuff, right? Like the problem is worrying that we're going to die, you know? That's the, that's the psychological, social problem. Right. Oh my God, it's with like, 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 like rubbernecking kind of deer in the headlights stuff. Um, it's really strange that, that, that we can only imagine this kind of world continuing or a totally bleak Triassic period desert and nothing else. Right? Like if we keep on that way, that's good. we're going to make it happen. Right? So we've got to have some other way of relating to it. And all I can do to contribute to it is use my own experience as like a very sometimes upset person and how do I get through that stuff, you know? And um, I think basically the idea that it's already gone wrong is actually incredibly relieving, you know? Like just, just don't think of it as this apocalypse that's about to happen. It's already happened, it's, al it's already collapsed, you know? Like, like it started at some point, I don't know when, some, some geologists are like 1945, some people are like 1784, which is a weirdly accurate date, and some people are like the colonialism period of 16 whatever, and some people are like 10,000 BC when so-called civilization started, and they, they're all true, right? Because they're all like overlapping kind of like um, catastrophes that are kind of like one thing created, the next thing created, the next thing, right? Um, so it's already happened whatever this is, and our job is to kind of like realize, realize that and like how to kind of scrape yourself off the floor when, when you know that. That's like, that's the mission as far as I'm concerned. So is, to, to tie it into the film, which we're gonna start in a couple minutes here. So is your being involved in that film like part of your responsibility, part of helping all of us realize we are in it? Yeah. Um, so, so the director, um, who was making the film with Jeff, wrote to me and was like, we, me and Jeff just read your stuff and you have to be in this film. And I'm ever so glad that I, I got to be in it. Um, they sort of used me as kind of triage on some of the scientism. You'll see when you see the film, there's a whole lot of like sciencey people, mostly guys, mostly white, like saying sciencey stuff as if it's like this religion thing. And um, I kind of did like fix it on that. Like, 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 like Susan would ask me these questions and I'd talk to it, you know, and you'll sort of see on the film, that's what's happening. And um, in a funny way, there's a funny juxtaposition between me and Jeff. It's like Jeff, Jeff is saying Tim things in a kind of Jeff way. And he's wearing this kind of lumberjack shirt and he's standing on this kind of mountainside and he's all very sort of sincere and whatever. And I'm standing on this railway track in Houston. There's this sort of weird Berlin bit of Houston that's really broken. You know, like all of Houston is really broken. There's a really, really broken bit that looks like the cover of Animals, Pink Floyd. And luckily, that's sort of roughly where I was born, so I feel quite home at, 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 at home there. And I'm standing on this railway track with a Women's Day of the Dead T-shirt, just talking weird stuff. You know, so I'm, I'm the funny man. I'm like the sort of weird, psychedelic Steve Buscemi, this weird imaginary... <laughs> kind of Big Lebowski film about ecology, you know. And, and, and sort of that, that was the interaction, you know. Um, and um, I guess, I won't, I won't, I won't tell you that, but well, well, maybe, well, no, maybe I will, right? Like, so, so towards the end of the production, um, the director was like, are there any bits of this that you would like to, lo to lose? You know, and I, and I said to her, look, we, we can't have um, this one person saying, racism is hardwired into the brain in a German accent. You can't have that, dude. This, this is a, thank you so much. Finally, the laughter. Thank you very much. And um, so don't do that because the optics are very bad. And she's like, what about the end of the film? The end of the film was the sunrise. And, and, and Jeff's quoting Teilhard de Chardin. He's talking about like harnessing the energy of love 
and it'll be like we've rediscovered fire, and there's this, end, there's this sunrise over the Pacific. It looks like an atom bomb test, dude. It's like the, you can't end a film about new sources of energy with something that looks like a hydrogen bomb. So I said, look, please not that. So then instead there's this kind of ex drone shot of, of, of Jeff instead, which is quite nice. Um, and then there's this bit that I haven't actually seen. And if this bit's in the film, I deeply apologize, but because I obviously didn't say it loud enough. I said, you've got to lose this bit where Jeff talks about sexual selection. You know, he's talking about like um, how, you know, having brightly colored things or whatever um, is a sexy thing. And he says this funny thing, which is like, it's for the purposes of attracting members of the opposite sex. Now, in evolutionary biology terms, it's very simple, the logic. Like, have you ever seen gay people? Okay, therefore, this can't be true, right? Like, think about the first beetle that evolved an iridescent wing case. Yeah, like, that was, wasn't for, for anything, it was just random. That's the whole thing about DNA, right? It's random mutation with respect to current need. But all the biologists are trained to think in this scientific way, like, why is it there? What's it for? What's the point of it? What's the utilitarian point? There was no point. And then think about like some female beetle finding that sexy. That's just like for no reason at all, like almost out of straight out of like Immanuel Kant. Like it's just purely non-conceptual. You just thought it was sexy. So the first or whatever in, in, in instances of that had no function at all. They weren't for anything whatsoever. Beauty evolved before the functionality, right? And so this whole thing that it's for heterosexual reproduction is really wrong. And I, so I, I, I really, because I, I didn't, I don't know what's going to happen. If it gets to that bit and it says that, please don't think, oh my God, Tim sucks. Because I tried so hard to persuade, thank you. I tried so hard to persuade Susan to, to take it out. So let's see what, let's see what happens because I haven't seen it for a while. Okay. So, so I guess one last kind of question. Um, if, well, I guess two questions. Um, do, are there e other, other, are there ecological films, eco-themed films that have inspired your Gosh. writing? And what would, what would you yeah. recommend? Wow. Like, what's the homework for yeah, what's all these the, folks? Oh, ooh, uh, um, I don't know how to, how you can do this, but the original David Attenborough series called um, Life on Earth, from the late 70s, it's just been remastered. If you can get your hands on it, oh my God. I, I, I watched it a couple of months ago. I couldn't believe it. First of all, this whole thing where new films about that are all about like, oh look, we showed the camera crew and there are human beings in here. They were doing it in, in 1979. They were already doing it. This whole idea that we weren't doing it and then suddenly this is a new idea to put the humans in is, is, is wrong. Second of all, there's this atonal music, and I don't know about you, but like all the music for documentaries about so-called nature are very schmaltzy and way too compelling. And atonal music allows you to think, right? Like it allows you that sort of some kind of headspace for you to have some thought, which is really, really, really important. Plus also, <laughs> David Attenborough hasn't got it completely together, you know? The continuity isn't quite right. And so there's this shot of him in the, 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 the third episode which is about reptiles. I love reptiles because there's total failures. This whole idea that reptiles are like kings or tyrants or whatever, that's just a mammal-centric human being thing. Björk's best friend's son gave me his reptile to look after, this bearded dragon. And, oh my God, he can hardly even stand up. His arms are like noodles. He's like a baggie full of little tiny baggies of water. It's just complete, he's rubbish. I'm writing this chapter for a book with this guy called Nicholas Royal in the first chat. It's called Lizards Are Rubbish, yeah? Uh, they, they, they've cracked. Like, like, like imagine, like, like the tadpoles, and then the water kind of evaporated for some reason in the, in the stream or the ditch or whatever, and some of them stayed alive. That's reptiles, right? You know, this whole tail-losing thing isn't clever. It's just a thing that tadpoles do, you know? And they, they, they're absolute rubbish. They're just solar panels. The reason why they have to be on top of your head is because they, they'll die if they're not near the sun. It's not to do with dominating. It's not this kind of reptile brain thing. That's just like, like, like a stupid human being thing, right? Um, Tim lost the plot. 
So David Attenborough, <laughs> and he's on this beach, and he's in this kind of weird flared khakis. You know, he's talking about these crabs, and it's all rather kind of late 70s. Then all of a sudden, he's in his purple corduroy trousers, and he's sitting on the, a mountainside. And I don't know why, maybe it's my sort of inner Welshman, because I'm Welsh-Austrian, which is a very bad combination, by the way. Um, he's, he's sitting on this Welsh mountainside in purple corduroys, you know, and he's, he's got this box, and he's like, sometimes it's necessary to, to, uh, to do this. And he's holding this box, and he's winding this thing. He said, sometimes it's hard to find the rocks you need. You've got to do something. I'm like, is this a bomb <laughs> you're about to explode here, David? And he presses this button, and this mountainside blows up. And I want that to be a meme so badly. Like, here's Attenborough. He's hitting it, and the White House explodes, you know. <laughs> Plus, also, I'd really love to train, like, like, could we get him and hypnotize him and get him to be, like, the ultimate assassin? Of, like, like, no one would see him coming, you know? I'm not going to say too much because they get arrested. But, like, can you imagine? It's David Attenborough. No one would know it was, it was David coming to kill you. Yeah. So watch that. Okay. And, and to that, I would add Kwana Scotty. Oh, for real? And if yeah. you ever take a class with me, oh. you'll see it, so... For real. Probably see it again and again. Um, and, and, and honestly, this film, I think, couldn't exist without Kwanaskazi, which is oh, a for real. primal ecological Absolutely. awareness film. Yeah, yeah. Um, work. So. It's very Kwanaskazi ish in many yeah. ways. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks for talking. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.